Good to see you again. Different glasses that time. That's right. Well, yes, I have a bunch of pairs lying around, so I don't lose them. Monday to Friday. And yes, and More or less. And Sonntag and Samstag. Ah, I see the German is going coming too. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> because I saw a clip where you played with Doc Cheatham and uh, kind of trumpet summit. You must have been twenty or something in Bern, yes. right? Yeah, I was older than twenty, but I looked younger then. Yes, yes, in Bern. Yeah, that was nice. Uh, I think Clark T Clark Terry played as well there. Uh, yes, Joe Clark Wilder Ter probably. Yeah. Clark Terry. It was well, actually the first time I was in Bern was nineteen eighty nine with with Clark Terry, Kenny Deverne, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. George Masso, Gus Johnson. Milt Hinton, Ralph Sutton, and Quite some other people. It was mm -hmm. it was am Beautiful. amazing when I look back on it. Mm -hmm. Are you from a musical background, family kind of stuff? N yes and no. You know, my mm -hmm. my father's father was a piano player back in the 1920s, but he died very young. He led like a territory jazz band in in montana in the late 20s and early 30s but he died very young so i never knew him and i never heard any mm -hmm. recordings or anything mm -hmm. my father and mother both liked music but they weren't musicians but they always had records of music around the house and mm -hmm. uh, encouraged me when i got interested in playing music to purchase some cds and, and music uh, or you you guys went out to listen to concerts or Went out to listen to concerts sometimes, yeah, mm -hmm. and uh, mm -hmm. and uh, just uh, like I said, they, we they, we weren't they weren't fanatical music, but once I showed an interest, it took me out to places where I could play and where I could hear people and meet people, and mm -hmm. encouraged me to play. Of course, my first, other than when I was very young, experimenting with things like. The harmonica when I was five or six years old and singing in the school choirs. When I was 10, I started playing the four string banjo. Mm. And that's where I started learning all the old tunes and learning how to mm -hmm. play with other people and improvise a little bit. And then eventually mm -hmm. worked my way into the guitar from there. Mm -hmm. And uh, eventually also studied music, is that right? studied the guitar i did i was i had a teacher originally on the banjo who was an old time professional musician he actually mm -hmm. gave me a great grounding and learning how to read music right right away and mm -hmm. like i said a lot of the old the old tunes and old banjo music and then i started teaching myself guitar from what i learned from other people and what i was hearing on records i got exposed okay. to some of the great jazz guitar players like Charlie Christian, Django Reinhardt, Barney Kessel, mm -hmm. and then eventually studied with a great player and teacher around New York, around Los Angeles, named Jimmy Weibel, who uh, his career spanned everything from the early Western swing bands like Bob Wills, through to playing with Red Norvo and Benny Goodman, and uh, being a studio player for a lot of the great players in the in the 60s and 70s. So he was my first real guitar teacher. Mm -hmm. What about Herb Ellis and Joe Pass? I just read you, you. You took some private lessons, or they were teaching on a weekly I, basis somewhere? Or no, I never actually took lessons from Joe or Herb. I used to go hear them play all the time. Mm -hmm. I was big fans of their playing from records, and then mm -hmm. I I met Joe Pass through. He did a couple of little seminars, you know, workshops for mm -hmm. groups of players, and okay. met him personally, but never actually took lessons from him. Just uh, mm -hmm. admired him from afar. <laughs> sat sat in sat in. We sat in his hotel room one afternoon in in uh, Denver at a jazz party just to play. But I took a lesson. Mm -hmm. uh, so, something else was was uh, Joe Diorio around because he's, Joe he's Diorio was around. Yes, Joe yeah. had moved to Southern California in the mid seventies, about the time that a uh, uh, a new 
guitar school was being formed by Howard Roberts, great mm-hmm. uh, studio and jazz guitar player. And he got a lot of his friends from the guitar world, from all aspects of the guitar world to, to either teach there or be, come and do guest seminars. Mm-hmm. So uh, Joe was one of the teachers from the very beginning. And I got to know Joe very well and uh, heard him play a lot too. There were two mm-hmm. other than, you know, the people we think of as Howard, Joe Pass, Herb Ellis, uh, Pat Martino mm-hmm. came by. He was involved in the early years. But the main, the really great teachers there the first years were uh, Joe Diero and a guy named Ron Eshte, who's living in California, wonderful. Uh, yeah, the name sounds seven str- Seven string guitar player, yeah. Mm-hmm. But you must have been how old at that time? We're talking now, more or less. I was about, well, I was about 18 to 19. I went to mm-hmm. the, the school when I was 18, right out of high school, right out of high school. Right out of high school. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. 18, 19. Mm-hmm. Right. And uh, go ahead, please. Oh, yeah. Well, I was going to say that my, my real education, the one of the most important education I has was a year or so after I'd finished the guitar school and I was playing around L.A. with different jazz groups that I could find and playing gigs, you know, weddings, whatever, parties. Mm-hmm. And I got a call from Red Norvo, the vibes player, to play with him for a summer in Atlantic City, New Jersey, like a, with a trio with bass, guitar, and vibes, uh, the same format that he used for years with people like Tal Farlow, Jimmy Wilde. And I fortunately, between my, my background in, in, in jazz and more traditional jazz and my repertoire, we hit it off well, and I went to work with him. For a summer in Atlantic City. It was my first trip to the East Coast. And Red was a great player, and he was also a very serious uh, taskmaster. He didn't he didn't tolerate anything less than the best. So initially we got around great in his in his living room. We were playing, oh yeah, this is great, great, you know, wonderful. We're gonna do this. Then I got in the gig and the very first tune, playing some some standard, and I'm playing. Uh, I'll just, I think I'm playing so great stuff, and he's kind of looking at me out of the corner of the eye and kind of sneering, <laughs> kind of <laughs> really. And then uh, I started to play. He told me to play rhythm guitar when the bass solo played. So I'm playing what I thought my version of what I thought was like Freddie Green style playing it and I'm going dun, 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 dun. And he, again he looks at me and says really it took all four mallets on the vibes and went dun, 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 just to show me how how bad it was <laughs> anyhow I at I talked to him and he explained he said God you're you're playing you're playing endless endless notes that don't make any sense and you know rhythm is supposed to be a rhythm it's not movement and anyhow he it, I really learned a lot from him. I learned more in my first week than I had in the first in the last five years, as far as actual performance mm-hmm. and listening, mm-hmm. and standards, playing with other other players. So he was one of my most important teachers. I went on to play with Red for about five years after that, various places. Oh, beautiful. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Always with no drums. So you were in charge of rhythm as well. No, no drums. Mm-hmm. Just so you really everybody had to be responsible for the time. And the balance mm-hmm. and uh, the swing, you know, mm-hmm. it was a great, great, great opportunity and a great education. I'm always grateful that for that. Yeah, sounds good. And uh, being a clarinet player myself, I came across your name, I guess, probably through uh, via Ken Peplovsky. So yes, uh, this came much later, or when did that happen? That collaboration with him. Well, it's, you know, five, six years later. I moved to New York in 1982. Mm-hmm. Okay. And, and Ken had moved about the same time from, from Cleveland. And I started mm-hmm. seeing him on little gigs around town, you know, a little lunchtime Dixieland gigs outside, some bands, a couple of big bands. And then we started to know mm-hmm. each other and play together. And over the next few years, we wound up 
playing together more and more. And eventually, at one point, a few years later, we decided that we could just tour as a duo, just guitar and clarinet. Mm -hmm. And and we uh, would do that whenever possible, do a couple little tours or a, a gig or even just a tune on a concert together. It was a really nice relationship. We did a lot of that for several years. Mm -hmm. And was it the repertoire that got the two of you together or the personal, like, personal uh, uh, admiration or something like that? We would just pick things that we like to play that, you know, we would mm -hmm. both, we would both bring things, you know, and try different things. I, uh, I always, you know, a lot of times it would just be a, a nice old tune that Ken liked to play, or I would pick mm -hmm. some, like maybe an adaption of a piano place piece that Duke Ellington did. Or uh, mm -hmm. I know, I, I know one time we worked out one of the big Spiderbeck piano solos for duo with clarinet and guitar in, in the dark, it's called. And then a few years later, when I got fascinated with Brazilian choro music, I would bring mm -hmm. a lot of the choros to him to try to play together. Is that, and you re recorded a lot for Concord, Concord, uh, the label. Is that now that turned into something else or it's gone or that label? <laughs> It's still around, but it's it, it was the original owner, Carl Jefferson, passed away in 1996, and he sold it to someone who he wanted to keep the same legacy, the same thing going. But very quickly, it drifted around. It got sold and resold a couple of times, and now it's owned by a huge corporation. And they basically, it, they have a huge catalog of the CDs. They bought out several other labels. They bought Fantasy. Uh, contemporary, a lot of the old labels, and it's all under the Concord thing. So it's, it's, I think they're recording a couple of, a couple of pop singers still, maybe a few jazz things, but I have nothing to do with them at this point. Mm -hmm. uh, they, there's, there, I think there's a few, maybe two or three of my recordings still in print in their catalog, but the rest of them have been, you know, mm -hmm. shoved aside <laughs> into, into the past. Right, right. And another great name I spotted when reading through your short biography on, on uh, I think, Wikipedia, it was. Uh, Mel Torme. Can you tell something about that guy? Because I, I love to Mel Tor Mel listen to him. Mel yeah, yeah. Mel, Tor Mel Torme. I only, I only had the chance to play, to be on one recording with him, thanks, thanks to Carl yeah. Jefferson. Yeah, uh -huh. and uh, he did one record, which was a tribute to early Bing Crosby, the, the, the Bing Crosby tunes that he sang mainly in the in the 30s from his movies. And uh, I just I just listened to that again about six months ago with my wife after not listening to it for years. And then mm -hmm. he, he sang, he was so, such a wonderful singer, it was beautiful. It was really thrilling. Yeah, um, yeah I did. I just did that one recorder with, with him, so I didn't have that much interaction. Ken Poplowski played with him a lot. He did some tours with him okay. overseas with uh, larger groups and with a small group, and he got to know him quite well. And uh, but, uh, but the recording you did was like a small group or orchestra, a big band. Or it, it, it was, was it? recorded. It was recorded. We recorded rhythm section tracks and there was a couple mm -hmm. instrumental solos from Ken and mm -hmm. Randy Sankey. But then they overdubbed a string section afterwards. Uh huh. And Mel stayed home and came later, or, or what? No, he was there. He, he was, was in there. the studio. Yeah, uh -huh. yeah, yeah. He did sing. He did sing tracks in the studio, as mm -hmm. I recall. Yeah, because I remember seeing him and talking to him there. Mm -hmm. He might have. He might have gone back and redone a couple of things, but he was in the studio and recorded. Mm -hmm. And was it kind of happening naturally uh, when you look back, how you started playing the guitar, playing gigs, doing this, doing that, making a living suddenly? How was it? Was it a, a planned thing, or, or like in a lot of cases, it just one thing led to another? Or was it well, planned? really, yeah, it did. It kind of one thing led to another. I mean, I, I always, I, I think that I was prepared. I had a couple of lucky breaks 
you know, get, and for, for instance, getting called by Red Norvo, someone who was just a name on old records to me, someone I would have never mm -hmm. connected with. But my interest and my people I'd been listening to prepared me to be able to step into that situation. And also, I was young enough and didn't have, I had a, I didn't have an attitude, so I was able to learn from them. Yeah, and that mattered a lot. And through through Red, I was exposed to some other people. I ran into, uh, in New York, shortly after I was there, I met Ruby Braff, the trumpet player, mm -hmm. and, and I spent many years playing with him too and learned a lot from him, and it was a great musical experience. And through these people, yeah, it was just one, one, one thing leads to another, and if you're, if you're out there involved in things, you meet more people mm -hmm. and try to try to prepare yourself for the opportunities to come along and and try to play music that you like and try to play it as well as you can. Mm -hmm. And is it fair to say that, for example, I know you in that kind of style of jazz. This is where you feel comfortable. This is your thing. Is that correct? Or you or maybe you're doing other things. Uh, in the cellar that is more uh, rock related i have no idea i mean i just know no, you from I, the swing kind of thing i really somehow i I've, I've really always been involved in a lot of the more traditional jazz i never really got it i didn't mm -hmm. start playing the guitar because of rock and roll like like many mm -hmm. people my age did i mean i see mm -hmm. interviews with a lot of my contemporaries and they say oh yeah when i was when i was 10 years old i heard the beatles and i had to play the guitar you know, or I was playing surf rock, and then a few years later, I I heard jazz records when I was very young, and that's the sound that Broadway. appealed to me and made, made me want to play music. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. other than other than a couple of years in L.A. of trying to cover the music I needed to play for, like I said, weddings, private parties, mm -hmm. things like that, mm -hmm. I've I've met enough people and played with enough people playing the kind of music I was interested in and somehow somehow it's gotten me this far. And then sorry and, and then i go ahead. Okay, yeah, that's right. And then I'm seeing another generation coming on that are playing the same type of music and playing it with their their new attitude and freshness. So it's a it's a if people approach it as as an evolving thing, not as just a museum piece. I think it'll always be alive. And how is your approach in that? Is it, there are, I'm sure there are tunes you played hundreds of times mm -hmm. and uh, hopefully you're still fully with them. And uh, because it's always, it's always about how you play them, right? So yes. Is there an is there an approach from you personally or from the guitar that gives you joy to play that kind of song for? Well, forever? I, I mean, I look I look for again I'm a I'm a guitar player. I've always liked a lot of harmony, and I listened to a lot of great piano players when I was young too. So I always had the sound of more harmony rather than less in my head. You know, mm -hmm. I I was I was listening. I've got the sound of those Art Tatum records in my head from when I was 15, 16 years old, as well as people like Bill Evans and uh, Thelonious Monk, who is one of my favorites too, is a different approach. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. so, and from, from playing with Ruby Braff, I got to understand how important a melody was too. And I, I look for a good, comp, a good balance of melody and interesting harmony and the flexibility mm -hmm. to change the harmony now and then too. So I don't know. I like mm -hmm. it. Uh, it. <laughs> I can't explain myself any more than that. I like. I like doing it. Yeah. I like. I like nice music. Mm -hmm. You know. You know the lyrics to all those songs. Like uh, no, no. I. I wish about. I did. But I'm, but I'm getting to know them better, you know. Mm -hmm. I, I played for years as a guitarist and playing all these tunes and playing, and also accompanying singers as well. And then finally, mm -hmm. a few years ago, my wife encouraged me to start singing a little bit. So I actually, 
found it really a new level to actually be able to sing the lyrics of these tunes I've been playing for 40 years, 50 years. And uh, mm -hmm. so that's become an additional thing that I try to keep in my musical beingness. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And did you notice that some standards might sound better in other keys in general or for the guitar along the way? Because that, that's something yeah. that would be interesting to know. Uh, uh, well, yeah, some, sometimes they lay, lay a little better for mm -hmm. for the range. They give you more flexibility. I, mm -hmm. I started playing seven string guitar over 25 years ago. So that gives me a little additional bass range. So I can play comfortably in some keys and get a nice full sound mm -hmm. yeah. in some keys where I couldn't have on the six string years ago. That's one of the reasons I started playing seven string is I wanted a little deeper access to harmony, almost like a, mm -hmm. a left hand of a piano player. It gives me a little more range mm -hmm. and more distance between the bass note and the, the bass note down here, bass note and the melody, you know, mm -hmm. it's, it's a constant, it's a constant exploration. Yeah. Every, every, every tune gives you different problems to solve and, mm -hmm and uh, figure out. Yeah. And what do, you, what do you do when, you, when you're on the road, when, when it comes to practicing or, or no time to practice? Uh, is, there, is there something that you found out yourself doing that helps you to somehow keep in shape? Well, that again varies too. If I'm playing a lot on the road, as you know, when you're playing every night, your chops come into shape and it focus much better than if even if you're just practicing at home every day. But so I try to keep it fresh by just reviewing a lot of the basics of music. I try to play uh, again. I can I can never have enough time to play things by Bach, like the Bach solo violin pieces or anything, because his mm -hmm. music is the basis of so much music that we've been playing for the past three or 400 years. And uh, I, f I find that those are interesting musically as well as technically keep me precise and honest. And then if there's, if there's something new that I have to learn to practice to get up for a new performance, I'll spend some time doing that. Mm. And uh, if I have more spare time, then I'll try to explore some tunes I've been thinking of that I haven't, haven't had the time to do when I've been out touring with someone. Mm. Yeah. A, a, a few years ago, I did a, 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 some tours and a recording with a violin player, Nigel Kennedy. Do you know who Nigel Kennedy is? Or? Yeah, how he looks like, but not, <laughs> not, the yeah, yeah. not, not too familiar. Yeah, but the, the yeah, name, everybody, course, yeah. yeah, well, he's, he's, very, he's a great classical violinist and he also likes to play a lot of different music he's been interested in playing like the gypsy jazz swing type of stuff mm -hmm. and Django, Django Reinhardt as mm -hmm. well as he likes to play his own composition as he likes to play uh, Jimi Hendrix music you know very <laughs> very <see>. loud <laughs> mm -hmm. but uh, he called me to he was doing a for a couple of seasons he was doing the music of George Gershwin Mm -hmm. And uh, he had met me years ago because he knew that I played sometimes in the Django Reinhardt style, swing style. Mm -hmm. So I did some tours with him playing, again, the Gershwin music is music that I've lived with all my life. So it was very easy and fun to play mm -hmm. that. And it was great to hear him play. But he also had some of his original compositions, which involved some improvising over some vamps and some different lines and stuff. So that was a, that gave me a challenge to learn how to play his music well and get into a different, a different spirit. And he was, and he was a uh, very passionate, very fun, very fun improviser. To, and it was a thrill to be on stage with him, but, and it was, it was challenging technically too, just to, mm -hmm. just to get into a different style with him. Mm -hmm. So, so I, I mean, was, in my case, yeah, I mean, in my case, it's the lip that's going when I, when I don't practice, but when you play the guitar, it's, it's the fingertips that are, that are kind oh. of. 
they, trying to find out that the kind of yeah, thing oh, yeah, 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 right, right, yeah, the lip with the chops. Uh, the fingertips mm -hmm. can get a little sore if you don't play for a long time, uh, uh -huh. but a few days, not such a problem. A couple of weeks, yes, mm -hmm. then you have to, you know, <laughs> like when when this uh, this uh, pandemic started two years ago and everybody mm -hmm. sat home for months, when I finally went out and played for like three nights in a row, mm -hmm. by the second, third night of saying, wait, my fingers hurt. They never hurt before. <laughs> so... Mm -hmm. So, so uh, does fortunately, it's 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 not so much the the pain as just your your coordination and your feel, you know, mm -hmm. your time feel, mm -hmm. and again relating to other players on the bandstand too. If you're playing duo, right. trio, quartet, mm -hmm. uh, of course I can sit and play by myself for hours, and I enjoy a lot of solo playing too. But it's a different mm -hmm. thing to react to someone else. Which is, and again, that's one of the joyful things about playing jazz is playing with other people. Yeah, right. yeah. I'm sure you play soon by Gershwin. I love that one. I do. Yeah, I I do it's, play it's that. It's not played I, that I, often. It's not it's not played too often. I don't know why, but it's it's a gorgeous tune. Yeah, it, it is. I, 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 I recorded that with George Van Epps years ago. He's the one who suggested that. But not mm -hmm. too many people play it, and and Nigel didn't play it either. <laughs> but but thanks for reminding me about that. Thanks for reminding me. I should try try to play it again soon. Soon in, in E flat, right? Uh, usually, yes, E flat. Usually? Okay, that's what I do. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, I'm never sure if it's original or. Yeah, it's a beautiful one. Yeah. You know, it, it's a, it's amazing how so many of again. I know you've been playing for a long time too, and I've been living with these tunes since I was. Well, I heard them when I was ten or younger, but uh, that whole repertoire of tunes is such part a part of our melodic uh, soul. You know, I mean. Uh, the, the melodies and the harmonies that Gershwin produced are uh, just, I don't know, very important to me. It's a, it's a major part of my music, like I said, either consciously or unconsciously. You mentioned playing solo, uh, mm -hmm. solo concerts. Yes. Yeah. Is that yes. something that happened to you? Is that something that happened to you, like to Joe Pass, that, that they kind of asked him, can you please uh, start doing something by yourself? Or, or, or you actually wanted to present something by yourself? Well, it just kind of evolved naturally over the years. I mean, occasionally I would like to, on a concert, I'd play one, one solo mm -hmm. piece or something as mm -hmm. a feature. Mm -hmm. And then from time to time, I'd find myself in situations where either half the band was later, I had to start early <laughs> and start playing. And then I just realized at one point that I could sustain interest by myself for an hour or two hours mm -hmm. and uh, developed the attitude of being able to just sit down and play and make music. Mm -hmm. And and it's it's hard in a way that you don't have external stimulus, you don't have someone to react against or with mm -hmm. or to support you. Mm -hmm. So it makes you think about changing the texture, changing the style, whether you're playing single notes, chords, two notes, whether you... Mm -hmm. uh, so it, it's it's evolved into something where I, I am able to just sit down and do it pretty comfortably, whether in my house or for a couple of people or for a whole concert. It's mm -hmm. it's something I enjoy doing. And, you and, and the set... Program? Or do you just play whatever you want to play then during the uh, I try to get a couple of notes so I remember so I don't forget to play a couple of things that I might remember good. Mm -hmm. But but I enjoy the challenge of someone sometimes it's in a formal situation. I enjoy the challenge of someone just naming a tune and trying to put together something on the spot, improvising it rather than having a set piece concert. Mm -hmm. I mean I've uh 
So I try to I try to put enough different things from the back my background that I like to play, whether they're pieces by guitar players I like or by piano players that I like, like I mentioned, Duke Ellington, Thelonious Monk, blah, blah, blah. Uh, Brazilian pieces, which I like, and uh, anything else that comes along that's interesting. The were you or are you teaching a site uh, when not playing? Is that was that a part or is that a part? I I have a, f a couple of private students and uh, mm. uh, and a couple and a couple of online students, but I don't have a full time teaching position. I never have mm -hmm. since since the days of that guitar school years ago. I taught there for a couple of years in the late seventies, and when I went to New York, every all my teaching was either private students or the occasional workshop clinic when I was on the road. Yeah. So, so you do that sometimes, like going to a university of music in so-and-so and give a clinic about the guitar and, and, and at night play at the campus or something like that? Yes, yes, exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's a nice thing to do. Yeah, it is when it happens. <laughs> Right. Maybe some uh, towards the end, some last words about you mentioned something about uh, going to Portugal or Spain. What was it? Oh, Spain. Yes. Spain. Yes, I'm going. I'm going to Spain again in well, two weeks. In two less than two weeks. Mm -hmm. I hadn't been to Spain for about twenty years, but uh, a tenor saxophone player in Spain, Enrique Piedro. Uh, uh, wrote me and invited me to come join him for a tour last February, no, March, last March. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was, there was enough dates. It was the, my first trip overseas since, again, since the, since the pandemic, but uh, it was, we came over and toured with uh, Enrique and a small group, a trombone player, old friend of mine from California named Dan Barrett, who had been playing with him mm -hmm. before. And uh, piano player from England, a bass player from Spain, drummer from south of France, and we had a nice, nice mm -hmm. little tour. So he invited me back this summer just for a few more dates. We're playing. Spring. We're playing. Actually, we're just playing in Madrid and in San Sebastian a couple of times. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And he's he's uh, again he's more he's uh, more of a very very energetic swing style player but he plays a lot of music by another great tenor saxophone player that i played with a lot years ago flip phillips he was a uh, one of the swing and post post swing bop area players and er enrique's playing some of his music so it's fun to play it with him oh, nice. yeah. and, and is it usually so that in uh let's say in summer that you usually come to Europe to play all those festivals uh, when you come to Europe or is it not connected with that? Yeah, well, that's summer months. I, I used to come to Europe a lot in the summer to play some festivals. But again, that that's all kind of stopped the last few years. So this is this is the only trip overseas this summer for me. I don't know what the what the festival scene is like yet or how it's how it's coming back. I will be back in the uh, in October, I'll be for a week in uh, Bavaria, Germany, Germany, and then a couple of weeks in England to play some dates there. I'll uh, be playing in uh, Germany with a, a clarinet player from the Munich area named Stefan Holstein. And uh, I don't know if you know that name at all, maybe. The name, yes. Uh, yeah, uh, I, I was tr trying to get in touch with him. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. He's a uh, he. He was a very good friend of a uh, wonderful German seven-string guitar player named Helmut Nieberle, who sadly passed away about two years ago. But for almost mm -hmm. ten years, I would come over and play with Helmut almost every year. So we're going to do a week long of concerts as a tribute to Helmut and playing a lot of his music and a lot of the music he liked to play. So. Just as a duo or with a rhythm section? We'll have a bass and a drum as well. Uh -huh. Yeah. Nice. And where do you guys play with Stefan? You know already? 
I don't know all the exact dates. I know we're in Regensburg uh -huh. and uh, Nuremberg. It's quite close. Maybe I can come uh, to listen, yeah. Yeah, oh, and also I know we're playing yeah. at the the Birdland in Neu Neuburg, which Neuburg, is near, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah Neu Neu mm -hmm. Neuburg. Neuburg? Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's uh, mm -hmm. close close to Munich. It's a nice, nice jazz club. Mm -hmm. So come on yeah, up. Sounds bring, like fun. Bring yes. your clarinet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, maybe you can help me to get, get in touch with Stefan because I when the pandemic started, I, I started doing these interviews only with jazz clarinet players. You know, and uh, yes. I heard about I heard about Stefan, but somehow I, I didn't get an answer or or a no or a yes. Huh. I don't know. I don't know. Maybe, maybe maybe you can pinch him a little bit. Uh, yes, I I'll uh, I will uh, write him a note and I'll and I'll send you his. Well, you have his email probably, but I'll I'll tell him that I talked mm -hmm. to you and that you guys should mm -hmm. hook up. Maybe it helps. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That's nice, yeah. And uh, are you still doing the, the Django kind of sound? Uh, what, like the hot club, the whatever? Now yeah. and then. Now and then, every once mm -hmm. in a while. Yeah, when I, I have the chance to. They have. Yeah, yeah. 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 It's, it's, a very, it's a very special music. You know, it's funny. Uh, when I got the call to play the music for the movie Sweet and Lowdown, and... Mm -hmm. and, and Dick Hyman, who was the musical director, said, "Well, Howard, can you play? Can you play like Django Reinhardt? Can you play exactly like Django Reinhardt?" Right. Uh, I, but I said, "Of course, Dick. Of course I can." But I said, "I've been listening to Django Reinhardt ever since I was 12 years old, and he's a major part of my m musical makeup. So the opportunity to play that music for that film and play in that style a little bit, even though it was an American character playing like that, it was really." a nice reconnection with that style. And since then, I've been able to play on some of the Django festivals around the country mm -hmm. and in the world and and meet a lot of players and, mm -hmm. and, and meet and find out that, that playing the music for that movie inspired a lot of younger players to get into Django, which was really nice to hear. Oh, really? Cool. Yeah. So you, ne you never know, you never know Who's listening? <laughs> That's right. And the gorgeous repertoire they have. I'm sure we have that. There's a, a fake book out, like Jungle's fake book. Oh, yes. Uh, yeah, there's tons yeah. of music. All those beautiful, all those beautiful tunes in it. Yeah. Yes. Well, we'll play some of them yes. together one day. I hold you to it. Yes, I hope so. Beautiful. Yeah, that would be nice. Well, uh, I guess we cover pretty much everything, right? Or is well, there something you you want to add? It's I, I, I I'm, think I'm that, usually doing that in a, in a loose kind of way that I'm not too much prepared, just having a that, nice chat and find out some things. Me, well, I'm not too much prepared either. But it's been lovely talking to you and getting some background, giving you some a little bit of my background, and yeah. uh, make me think about some of these things. So. Uh, I look forward to meeting you in person one of these days, I hope, and hearing you play. Yeah, I, yeah, I hope I can make it to the Bavarian thing. You're coming in October, right? Y yes. Yeah. yeah. I'm optimistic about that. Mm -hmm. Great. Very cool. Then uh, have a, it's, I think it's lunchtime, right? It's about lunchtime. Yeah. Yeah. I, uh... Time time for Mittagessen. Let's do that. <laughs> okay. Howard, it was a pleasure. Thanks again for joining me here. My pleasure. See you next time. See you in real life. Bye-bye. Yes, indeed. Cheers.